All right, it's five o'clock, so I would start now. And yeah, people will just continue to join. Uh, it's great to already see a lot of people here. Um, yeah, so welcome and good evening, morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Thank you for joining us for our webinar discussion. Um, or yeah, our webinar discussing the utterly relevant topic of nuclear weapons and feminist foreign policy. My name is Sheena Anderson. I am a project manager at the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, and I have the honor of moderating this event today. At CFFP, I am responsible for our programs on climate justice and anti-racism, and I'm also in charge of the project on a feminist take on nuclear weapons, which uh, this event is part of. CFFP is a research, advocacy, and consulting organization dedicated to promoting an intersectional approach to feminist foreign policy across the globe. My dear colleague will post a link to our new website in the chat in case you don't know us yet and want to learn more. We are hosting this event today for mainly two reasons. First of all, the German government is currently in the process of developing and implementing a feminist foreign policy, mainly under the leadership of our foreign minister, Annalena Baerbock and her ministry. While at the same time, the Russian aggression and war against Ukraine obviously heavily impacted the discourse around disarmament, peace and security, and of course, also nuclear policy and thus nuclear weapons. What does this mean for the development of a feminist foreign policy and what role do nuclear weapons and nuclear disarmament play? Second, we have been a strong advocate for demilitarization and disarmament, including nuclear disarmament ever since our foundation in 2018. Both these topics are at the very core of feminist activism and work in foreign and security policy, and feminists have been at the front fighting for peace, disarmament, and diplomatic solutions from the beginning. That said, I want to give a shout out uh, to other organizations in this field who have been doing this work for way longer than we have. Many of them we have the honor of working uh, with together and collaborating. We are following in your footsteps, and although this topic is heavy and quite challenging, it is a joy to walk beside you on this path towards a feminist foreign policy that prioritizes peace, demilitarization, and disarmament. Some of these organizations are, of course, ICANN, the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, local activist organizations in Büchel and elsewhere, and of course, survivors of nuclear testing and their ongoing fights for justice. A few words on what we have planned today. Uh, Beatrice Finn of ICANN will give a keynote setting the scene. Uh, we will then have a panel discussion with various experts whom I will introduce shortly beforehand. Um, unfortunately, our panelist, um, Member of Parliament, uh, Melish Bellebeck, had to cancel because she is sick, but I'm more than excited to hear the inputs and takes from Niambi Morris, Anna Hauschild, and Elke Connor. You will, of course, have the chance to ask questions after the discussion, and the Q&A will uh, be followed by a short intro to our new policy briefing, which we are officially launching with this event. And lastly, we will end with an intervention and plea by Anna. Now, let me introduce uh, Beatrice Finn before I pass on the mic. Um, Beatrice is the executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, short ICANN, the 2017 Nobel Peace Prize winning campaign coalition that works to prohibit and eliminate nuclear weapons. She's been leading the campaign since 2014 and has worked to mobilize civil society throughout the development of the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, also known as TPNW, that entered into force on January 22nd in 2021, so almost two years ago. She has recently been listed as one of the 50 innovators who changed the global landscape in 2017 by Bloomberg Media, and is also the executive producer of the film The Day the World Changed, a virtual reality memorial experience to pay uh, tribute to those affected directly by nuclear warfare. And if I may add, she's also a dear friend and ally of CFFP, which we are very grateful for. Bea, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Sheena. Uh, it's really, really great to be here uh, to see so many participants uh, who are 
eager to learn more about this issue and a huge thanks to the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy for organizing this. You guys always make, organize really great events and interesting discussions, so I'm really glad to be here. So the idea of uh, feminist foreign policy um, sort of came into the mainstream and became a concept that a lot of people heard about around 2014 when the then form, um, former foreign minister Margot Wallström uh, announced that Sweden would have a for feminist foreign policy as the first country. But I think it's important to recognize that it didn't start with that. This kind of work has been going on for a long time. And in fact, before I can, I also worked for the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, uh, as Sheena mentioned also earlier before, um, which was is the oldest women's peace organization. Um, and I know that Anna, uh, is going to probably mention this later, but I just wanted to draw attention that these women that founded WILF in 1915, just on the verge of the outbreak of World War I, gathered in The Hague to protest war, protest militarism, and they created this manifest. Uh, and if you, I'm sure you can Google it if you want to read it. This manifest from 1915 sort of questions militarism, questions war from a feminist perspective. And it's really, is really worth reading because it's so current, it could have been written today. Uh, so this work from women's org uh, organizations has been going on for over 100 years. Um, and since the use of nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons were, were developed in 1945, also nuclear weapons have been part of that kind of conversation. And I think it's really important that we talk about this right now, and particularly as we're watching the horrific consequences of Russia's invasion uh, in Ukraine, seeing the uh, enormous casualties of civilians, uh, but also the following sort of militarism and warmongering that we see right now. Um, it's really important that we talk about what our feminist foreign policy and perspective on these issues are. So why is the feminist foreign policy so important for achieving peace and security? And how does it sort of connect to nuclear weapons? It's a little bit what I want to talk about it. Um, to me, it's really about um, having a gender perspective on disarmament, on nuclear weapons, on peace and security is about challenging the current state of affairs. Uh, and it's such a key tool that we can use for creating a safer, better world for everyone. And to me, I usually like to, you know, there's as many definitions of feminist foreign policies and different takes on this as it is people um, engaged in this issue. But for me personally, I really do like to kind of frame it around three key aspects of why, how feminist foreign policy uh, and nuclear weapons are related. And for me, the number, uh, you know, the first thing that's really important is the making sure that we talk and acknowledge and address the specific impact that nuclear weapons have on, on women. Um, for example, there's, you know, in, in general, like there's very specific gendered impacts of the use of weapon. People can suffer disproportionate from different impacts based on their sex, gender identity, or sexual orientation, inside and outside of armed conflict. So, you know, while we can of course recognize that men uh, tend to make up the majority of direct victims in our violence, uh, women and other genders um, are, however, can face different impacts um, based on the use of such weapons, uh, such as exaggerated social and political inequalities, pressures from the increase of female-headed households, inequalities in access to survivor assistance, and higher risk for sexual and gender-based violence. And this, these specific impacts um, are not always visible at first. Uh, and for example, nuclear weapons, I think, is a really good example of that. So very few people considered specific gendered impact of nuclear weapons. Uh, the presumption is very often that, well, everyone's going to die if there's nuclear war, no matter what sex you are or how you identify. But it really ignores the long term impact of survivors and what we've seen in history based on the uh, the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but also the almost 2,000 nuclear tests around um, the world. Because actually research has shown that women survivors in Hiroshima and Nagasaki had nearly double the risk of developing and dying from cancers due to the ionizing radiation exposure. Uh, pregnant uh, women exposed to nuclear radiation face a greater likelihood of delivering children with physical malformations and stillbirths leading to increased maternal mortality, for example. And these effects last generation. And near the infamous Semipalatinsk nuclear test site in Kazakhstan, where Soviet 
did the majority of their nuclear tests. Uh, still today, one in every two babies that are born is born with a disease that can be traced back to nuclear testing, uh, including serious deformities, um, for example, bringing really significant challenges uh, to the primary caretakers who, as we know, are very often mainly women. But yet a lot of official evaluations does not consider gender and age sensitive impacts. Uh, a lot of the measurement on the impact of radiation has used the standard man uh, as uh, the kind of norm in the research, uh, not showing how kind of um, women's body take up more radiation due to more soft tissue, for example, or to the reproductive system. Um, so without fully considering the way nuclear weapons testing use, but also probably production sites consider um, how they impact different people, we make worse decision on the policy side. Um, and that is often also due to lack of equal representation in decision-making, which leads me into the sort of second key point uh, that I believe that feminist foreign policy should include when it comes to nuclear weapons, ensuring equal representation of women in nuclear disarmament treaties uh, and nuclear policy strategy sort of negotiations. Um, decisions that impact all of society need to, be, to really include all of society in the conversations. Um, I don't really subscribe to the idea that women are naturally more peaceful than men. I just believe that women are very often put in other roles in society, into caretaking positions, into the ones that are not sitting uh, maybe in the political sphere as much, but more in the in other spheres, uh, mainly responsible for healthcare decisions or, or educational decisions. Um, and we need those perspectives as well, because uh, when it comes to decisions around nuclear weapons, those perspectives are very needed. Um, the, for someone who's put in charge of caring for injured or sick people, or put in charge of educating children, the perspective and the impact of, of the impact and the consequences of war will be quite difficult, uh, different than one who's been put in charge of a battalion. Um, but when it comes to international relations, foreign policy, and in particular weapons, I think it's very extreme this field, there's a really stark disparity in the level and volume of participation of women, men, and non-binary or gender non-conforming people. And that's a massive problem because if you think about nuclear weapons, uh, like sort of in all levels of decision-making from the head of state of the nuclear armed states, for example, to the generals, defense ministers, foreign ministers, parliamentarians, military advisors, soldiers, think tanks, experts, war correspondents, defense journalists, all of these kind of groups are heavily dominated by women. And this underrepresentation of women is fueled in part by the tendency to treat women as vulnerable victims, usually grouped together with children and elderly, and all this framing reinforces the sort of persistent construction of women as the weaker sex in need of protection by powerful men and enables sort of women's continued exclusion from kind of the key authoritative social and political roles in society. Um, and, you know, because of that, like nuclear weapons treaties have really been negotiated in patriarchal structures with access only for elitist groups. Um, you can look at kind of conferences like the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conferences uh, really reflects that kind of systems. Uh, some few states are sort of ultimately decides on the proposal for that is going to be adopted or not, while the majority of other states around the world are simply expected to agree. Um, so research has shown that any given intergovernmental meeting on disarmament of only about one quarter of participants are women. And almost half of all delegations are likely to be composed entirely by men. Less than a fifth of the statements in these kind of meetings are likely to be given by women. Uh, so I think it's really important that when we talk about feminist foreign policy, that the representation is a key part. It's not everything, uh, and it's just one kind of aspect of it, but it is a really key part. Um, because it's like, we can't just add women. Uh, and I think this is what's really, really important that we push beyond the narrative of just kind of including women and bringing women at the table, because it's also about being listened to and being valued uh, and not conforming the women who are putting that position aren't just conforming to the dominant narrative of the group. 
so bringing a feminist per uh, perspective on nuclear weapons isn't just about including more women uh, into this existing kind of systems of already structural inequalities and quite violent masculinities. So we also need, and this is my third point, a gendered lens on the discourse around uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, we need to look at how we talk and what we value. Um, that framing of women as weak and vulnerable is really used to construct a devalued notion of peace, um, seeing it as unrealistic, passive, undesirable. Um, you sort of mark certain perspectives as feminine, uh, which gives nuclear weapons a positive value because it's seen as masculine, it's like a masculine sign of power. So even as we are seeing that it's changing and more women are brought into decision-making related to nuclear weapons, their positions, ideas are also often forced in order to make it into those rooms to conform to the male dominant perspective in order to be taken serious and even get access to these spaces. Um, and again, like women don't have one perspective on nuclear weapons while men have another. It's not that what I'm saying, but these kind of gender perspective on nuclear weapons really shape what society believes is acceptable and therefore represents what is seen as strength or logic or rational. And I think that you can really see that skewed view of what's seen as rational and strong, that it's sort of shaping the narrative around nuclear weapons by decision makers, by media and others. Um, many of us maybe remember when the US President Trump uh, tweeted, I too have a nuclear button, but it's much bigger and more powerful than his and my button works during the kind of period of nuclear saber rattling between him and Kim Jong-un in North Korea. And even in Germany, I remember during the election campaign, um, an article in The Economist described its concerns about Germans, Germany's new government as being more reluctant to support nuclear, uh, nuclear weapons as with the headline, is Germany going soft on nukes? So clearly kind of indicating here that disarmament is soft, unattractive, weak, more nuclear weapons is strong, masculine, tough. And I think that, you know, weapons and war and using force to get what you want is always seen as much strong. Uh, negotiations, compromise, diplomacy, cooperating to get what you want is seen as weak. Those talking about humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapon and calling for the prohibition are accused of being sort of divisive, polarizing, or even emotional. And this really continues despite the many continued failures of nuclear weapons and war as an effective way to prevent, provide security and safety of people. Uh, more and more modern nuclear weapons in Europe have not stopped Putin from invading Ukraine. A uh, 20 year war in Afghanistan achieved very little, but it's still seen as more rational than the weak alternatives of disarmament, development, educating, supporting women's rights and civil society and things like that. So with those considerations in mind and these kind of three perspectives, I want to talk a little bit about Germany. Um, the new German uh, government, well, not so new anymore, actually, uh, it's a little bit in, um, has the goal of implementing a feminist foreign policy in its coalition agreement. Um, the government has also made a welcome step to change its rhetoric around nuclear weapons and particularly the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. And I really welcome the recognition of the sort of humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons in the speech by Foreign Minister Baerbock at the MPT review conference last year. And the German statement that they deliver at the, the Treaty on the Prohibitions of Nuclear Weapons first meeting of states parties in Vienna, it kind of indicated an openness to listen to new perspectives, uh, such as from survivors and, and affected communities. But I think it's important that we're not just content with such announcements and some nice words here and there, as long as policies don't change or when feminist ideas have been sidelined as soon as it will disrupt established practices of foreign policy decision making. Um, and unfortunately, civil society has been marginalized for many processes involving security and defense policy in Germany in the last year. For example, Germany is coordinating right now a new national security strategy where a dialogue was promised but effectively was reduced to NGOs writing blog articles. And the, the strategy itself is written by a small elitist group without effectively engaging feminist thinkers or activists. So I think that civil society really has to be consulted meaningfully in processes like this one to get started with a feminist foreign policy. And similarly, with Germany's new uh, nuclear weapons policy should reflect the feminist approach the new government has prescribed itself. Germany should put an end to nuclear sharing or at least start developing a plan for removing the nuclear weapons placed in Germany. 
And maintaining the status quo and continuing the way it was uh, means maintaining a patriarchal system based on the exclusion of feminists and civil society. So I really think it's time now to push further from the rhetoric to action. And together with the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, we've developed several rec recommendations for short and long-term policies. Um, and I wanna just touch upon a few of them that I think that Germany could implement immediately. Um, I think it's very important that Germany um, should acknowledge shared responsibility for the suffering of communities affected by nuclear testing. Um, well, let's recall that Germany had colonized the Marshall Islands, a nation to, that to this day is struggling to get adequate compensation for the damage caused by the many nuclear tests. And Germany should really fund um, research on the humanitarian impacts of nuclear weapons. And such research can be international, but also focused on Germany. Uh, uranium mining in the former territory of the GDR helped the Soviet Union produce nuclear weapons. And it's largely understudied and remains a political taboo to talk about. And the government should really advocate to reduce the role of nuclear weapons in NATO and Germany's security strategy and to continue to engage with the TPW constructively, including on victim assistance and environmental remediation. And the official German position should recognize the TPW as compatible with the NPT and should promote this compatibility among NATO states. Um, similarly, I would really love to see Germany encourage all NATO states to observe the next meeting of states' parties and announce its own participation timely as the social democratic group in the parliament just pushed for. And of course, ultimately, we would like Germany to sign and ratify the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons. So with those few points, long points, uh, I want to hand on back to you, Sheena. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for for this and yeah, there was already a lot, um, a lot in there. Um, yeah, just the, the the importance to challenge uh, the current state of um, uh, the current state of affairs, um, making sure that we acknowledge uh, the specific impacts nuclear weapons have on uh, on women, on uh, other marginalized people, on other genders, um, and what I thought was very important. And I mean, I know that you, we, a lot of feminist actors keep saying that, but really making it clear, it is not about placing women as supposedly better people or more peaceful peop uh, people, but to making it clear that uh, there are gendered dynamics within the nuclear discourse and within uh, the field of foreign and security policy. And it is so important that we point that out and, and, and talk about it and talk about the consequences um, that uh, these structures have. And it is ultimately so much about power structures um, also. Yeah, so yeah, thank you so much for this. And uh, I think this already gave us so much to discuss further on. Um, I would now quickly um, introduce the other speakers and then we would uh, start with the panel discussion. So on the panel, we have Niambi Morris. Niambi is a 24 year old Ugandan climate activist and the founder and CEO of the nonprofit organization, Earth Volunteers. He began his activism due to the direct impact uh, flooding had on his family, disrupting his parents' source of livelihood and forcing them to relocate. His work and story as a climate migrant has been featured on BBC, CBC, CNN, and many others. Um, and yeah, we're so lucky to, to have you with us today. Also on the panel is Anna Hauschild. Anna is a young feminist and nuclear disarmament advocate with the Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, short WILP, and uh, also the International uh, Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, ICANN. Uh, she's a board member of the German section of WILP and coordinates their Young WILP uh, Youth Network. As a social society delegate, uh, she also participated in the first meeting of states parties to the TPNW in uh, Vienna last year in, 20, um, in uh, June in 2022. She also holds a master's degree in gender peace and security from the London School of Economics and has a specific interest in the role of feminist and decolonial perspectives uh, play in nuclear uh, knowledge production and disarmament processes. And then finally, we also have uh, Elke Koller on uh, the 
panel. Elke Kolle is a pharmacist from Lower Saxony in Germany. She joined the Green Party in 1990 um, and has since held various party positions on regional level. She, however, left the party in 2002 in protest against a mission in Afghanistan. Since uh, the 90s, she has been a leading figure in the peace movement, especially when it comes to the protests uh, against nuclear weapons. Elke Kolle lives in Büchel, um, so that's the exact place where U.S. nuclear weapons are stored and uh, hosted in Germany, and she has been one of the driving forces of the local branch of the campaign Büchel ist überall, Atom machen frei jetzt, or in English, Büchel is everywhere, no nukes now. Elke Kolle has already received many awards for her commitment and activism, including the Aachen Peace Prize in 2019. And uh, yeah, um, Ms. Kolle, I would actually start with you, um, uh, giving you the first question. Um, can you give us a little uh, background? What is the context of new, uh, US nuclear weapons being stationed in uh, Büchel? And what is the current situation for local uh, activism against them? Yes, thank you, Sheena. I'm Elke Koller, you said already, and I'm living only three kilometers near the airbase Büchel, where the US atomic bombs are stored. And I protested against these terrible bombs since 1996, when I heard of these bombs for the first time. At the moment, it's a little bit calm here because the tornado aircrafts exercises in Nervenich. The airbase Büchel just will be armed to get the new F-35 fighters from the US. They shall transport the new B-6112 US atomic bombs in the future. The costs will be two, uh, 200 million euro and more for modernizing the airbase, airbase and perhaps 8 million euro for the new F-35 fighters. The local activism in the past was very difficult because the local people worried about their jobs when the US bombs get away. In personal discussion, many of them confess to be as worried than I for the nuclear threat, but they have no courage to assist us in protesting because their neighbor works at the airbase and so on. Therefore, we are happy when activists from outside reinforces us. Each year we have a demonstration with many hundred people at the Ostermarsch and 2000 of demonstrators were coming, for example, to a music blockade in 2013 or the human chain in 2021. And also some peacemakers from around the Eiffel and Hunsrück share with us regularly when we make our memory, memorial sittings or peace prayers and so on. This is also very important for us. And on my side, there is Hildegard, please look. <laughs> she <laughs> assisted me very often and I'm very happy that she does this. Okay, that's first what I have to say. Thank you so much. Um, and yeah, very, very important. I think for a lot of people, at least we experience that in, in our work at CFFP, that there's just not a lot of awareness um, within the broader uh, German public about the local activism, about the nuclear weapons in, in general. So yeah, um, your work and activism is just uh, so important in, in this field. Um, I would uh, maybe have one question for, for Anna and then go to, to uh, Nyambi. Um, just kind of referring to, to what I just said that a lot of people either don't know about the topic, but we also experience that a lot of people maybe don't feel comfortable talking about the topic because they have the feeling you need to be an expert or you need like tech expertise uh, to talk about this, uh, to talk about this issue. And this actually um, leads to, to people being silenced or to just not being included in, in this debate. Um, so yeah, my question to you would be, how can we better communicate uh, this topic and who is actually viewed as an expert and who isn't uh, within this uh, nuclear weapons uh, discourse and uh, discussion? Yes, thank you so much. So first of all, thank you. 
um, for having me as well. Um, that's a question I'm thinking about a lot, especially uh, within advocacy, within activism. There's also a lot of about coalition building, about raising awareness, of course. Um, and nuclear weapons and nuclear weapons policies, I think of one security policy in general, but I think nuclear weapons policy very specifically are a topic that seems in the political debate like a debate that can only be, dis be discussed by high level experts. And who is a high level expert is very much dominated or um, manufactured both by those who are in decision making positions um, and who have been for a very long time, uh, which are often white men um, in certain decision making positions claiming expertise because it mm, seems to be such a highly specialized topic. And I would like to just start with breaking that, like br breaking that assumption because like nuclear weapons and the threat of nuclear weapons are an issue everybody should be concerned. I do think in the past year because of the Russian invasion on Ukraine and the also explicit threats of use um, made that clearer and there has been more um, maybe awareness in a sense but also uh, maybe a little bit like a numbing feeling. I think the, the broader public really feels numb and thinks they do not know enough to join a conversation and I think having a feminist perspective and having a perspective that highlights power structures and that also sees similarities and interrelations to other um, issues of injustice, uh, such as climate justice debates, for example, really shows how we can kind of bridge gaps between an understanding of why this is an issue. Because in the end, it is about power structures. It is about who makes decisions for whom, and but who is also maybe affected or threatened by these decisions. And I think there is, uh, definitely a gender dimension of who's considered an expert. There's a racialized dimension of who's considered an expert. But I also want to highlight there's also a generational or age dimension of who is considered an expert. Um, and as a young woman in the field, uh, I really try to emphasize that joining this debate, maybe coming from other, from, from, from other uh, fields um, of resistance or political action or expertise um, is really important. Um, and the power level is definitely uh, a dimension that highlights that and also that brings other voices and perspectives into the debate. And I think that can only be useful. Thank you so much. Um, yeah, so so important for for highlighting that. Um, yeah, making clear like he was usually viewed as an expert, and um, it's so important that we think of these different dimensions. And as you said, um, and that brought me to uh, what what uh, Bea sh shared earlier already about nuclear testing, um, uh, the many tests that have uh, taken place on formerly colonized uh, ground. So obviously a race perspective uh, uh, and a race issue is, is coming into place here. Like he was viewed an expert he was, uh, who is being listened to, um, but then obviously also what you, what you made very clear, um, the generational um, aspect, um, yeah, so Thank you so much. Um, I would now uh, go to uh, Nyombi and ask, or yeah, ask more for the connection with climate as I lead the climate justice uh, program and I'm a climate justice activist myself. This is like very dear to my heart. Um, so most people know that nuclear weapons are dangerous, obviously, but many people might not know um, the climatic and environmental threat nuclear weapons pose. So if you could explain what exactly is the connection here between nuclear policy and climate justice or injustice? Uh, thank you so much, Shina, for the wonderful introduction. And uh, thank you so much for asking this question. I know this question has been lingering for so long time. And uh, 
I believe today I can answer it and I'll be a little bit brief. Uh, first of all, people need to understand that environmental justice is social justice, racial justice, and gender justice, but we can't achieve all that in a world with climate change, wars, exploitation of indigenous land for minerals, and with leaders who enjoy expressing their power through developing nuclear weapon. There is a misconception uh, that uh, those with nuclear weapon are superpower. But did you know how many people have died as a result of that process? For example, after the United States of America bombed uh, Nagasaki and Hiroshima in 1945, the children that were born around that time had disabilities and uh, lameness, which is a crime against humanity. And as environmentalists, we fight for a livable planet and for everyone. And we believe that everyone has a right to live in peace and in a world free from chemical and biological weapons that harm livelihood and food system, which is one of the reasons why we must collaborate because we are fighting to save humanity from perpetrators. I know and I've seen so many times uh, where human scientists have repeatedly warned us that with nuke and climate change are enemies. They must be phased out as soon as possible in order to protect our future and the future of those who come after us, but also to protect our families. However, it seems like people are not listening. So we need to add more effort. Thank you, I'll add more. Thank you so much. And um, yeah, I think that's something a lot of people, uh, especially when talking to so-called high level experts, just don't keep in mind the, the environmental threats, the climatic issues around nuclear weapons. And that obviously if a bomb would be detonated like what what impacts that would have for like decades so um all of this is so important and i think that's that's something that um feminist uh, activists a lot of local activists have been trying to push for to really um have a better overview of the intersections of these various fields and topics and, and, and really joining joining fights instead of like focusing on, on, on one topic um, only. And I think, uh, yeah, um, Anna already also mentioned that um, before. Um, before I go into the second round, just uh, looking over to Bea, if you wanted to come in on anything of uh, what has been said already, um, uh, yeah, or if we go for the second round. No, just that I agree with everyone. <laughs> I'm nodding <laughs> I very much so. here. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Um, yeah, then I would uh, go uh, back to uh, Elke uh, Koller and uh, just to make clear maybe for, for all of our uh, listeners, how would you say, how do German policymakers react to the local activism against uh, nuclear weapons that you have been a part of? Uh, what are the challenges, but maybe also the achievements of uh, your activism so far? Yes, I think the local policymakers react like the local inhabitants. They leave aside the nuclear threat and only think about the local jobs. They don't think about an accident, a terror attack or an error message. And they are naive in believing the nuclear bombs will save them if a nuclear war will happen. That's wrong because the bombs are an attack bombs and not for saving. But in the next level in the parliament of Rhineland Palatinate, the policymakers, the parliaments are more sensitive in 2019, they decided a resolution to support the TPNW. And we were happy about this punctual success, only a punctual, but very important. The resolution was supported by the parties SPD, Greens and FDP. CDU and AfD, AfD voted against. And the picture will be like our demos. Some policymakers from the Greens, the SPD, and the Link is shared with us and give us some support. But politicians from CDU and even FDP, we never have seen there in Büchel. Yes, that's. 
Well, it's quite sad. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you, you would think such an important topic, people would make an effort to, to be there to talk to people. Um, but um, yeah, then again, it's also not not surprising, maybe, um, as we know, um, the government has been refraining, specifically mentioning the weapons and talking about them. Um, so yeah, thank you so much. Um, uh, coming back to to uh, Niambi and maybe more of a of a climate aspect, um, uranium mining, and I know you've been talking about this for a while, and it's dangerous. Uh, make it clear that nuclear weapons are dangerous uh, way before a nuclear weapon is actually used. Could you elaborate a bit on the dangers of uranium mining, um, their like yeah role for nuclear weapons, and uh, maybe also why you specifically work in this field uh can you hear me yes uh thank you again for this uh i know many people don't know much about uranium but at least uh to the experience i have seen so far what i have seen uh it is worth stopping uranium than stopping uh the production of nuclear weapon one uranium uranium itself or uranium mining has a far-reaching consequences like polluting the environment with radioactive dust, radon gas, waterborne toxins, and higher level of ground radiation. But furthermore, we should be aware that uranium mining is the first step in developing of nuclear power and nuclear weapon. That's why I say, if possible, we can adjust the fight and go back where it all starts the mining. Mining currently is responsible for 4 to 7% of greenhouse gas emissions globally and contribute to the migration, the one we see today. You may be asking how. For example, agriculture is the Africa's most important source of income as well as source of employment to women, particularly single mothers in rural and those from other developed countries without excluding Asia. But every time we allow sustainable projects like mining to exist, we are said to see a large number of increased migrants all over the world because mining does not leave carbon sinks in place and does not leave temperatures the same. 70% of areas where mining has been carried, what is left is drought. Poverty and hunger. Now imagine a family that has been relying so heavily on farming, a community that has, that has been relying so heavily on rainwater, but they are unable to receive it because the carbon sinks or the social rainfall like forests have been put down. This is happening even in Congo Basin. Now, when they are unable to receive or like when people in these communities are unable to receive water in time, uh, rainfall in time, or they are unable to grow food in time, sometimes parents end up calling out their children to come and support or to come and start helping them because some long distance are so hard for old, like to our, to our parents who are older than like 45, sometimes they're unable to move. So in such cases, girls are forced to move out of school to come back and help their parents, which makes it so hard that many of them end up working in heavy labor, such as stone quarrying. We have seen so many women in stone quarrying that just because they are unable to get good jobs because of lack of education, but at the same time, 70% of these women or girls who come out of school, uh, like they end up in marriage, like in early marriage, we have seen reports where, uh, like I, I think this this report was released or was it last year, uh, where they talked about Africa, like child labor in Africa is increasing every day. But this this is some of the steps that causes all this. That seventy percent of girls who drop out of school to seek for survival or to help their parents, they end up settling into dowry or into marriage because sometimes they fail. Imagine you are young and uh, you happen to find someone who is trying to uh, lie to you that they have money, you know? You are out to look for money to help your parents and they are 
there you find a guy who can help you with some money. In the end, their target is to force you into marriage. And because of that, we have not been able to, to see at least women in political leadership in areas where mining extraction has been happening. I can even bet on this because we have a region in Northern Uganda where this has been happening for years. And when you go there, like pe people from that side, they don't even believe that they can even be leaders or they can even be uh, important in community. But this, this region has lots of minerals. So some may believe that the effects of uranium mining only affect people who live in areas where the mining is happening. However, if your country has a power plant or if you haven't, like, yeah, if your country has a power plant and you haven't experienced water shortage or water pollution, just wait. Did you know that nuclear weapon or nuclear power plant, yes, use a lot of water during the time of operation for steam production and cooling. I see a lot of uh, new power plants being set up in USA, uh, Asia, and UK. But you should be aware that that used water is then discharged containing heavy metals and salt that can harm aquatic life and degrade water quality. So waste from uranium mining operation can pollute groundwater and who doesn't need water? This all happens during the time of manufacturing. And sometimes you cannot observe it. By the time they announce that, uh, yes, we have completed the first nuclear arsenal in place, just know it has destroyed a lot of people's future, uh, people's livelihood, and also, you may be part of those who have got some diseases when you don't know. And in the end, when you go to hospital, they will find something weird and be like, no, this is not, I, I didn't expect this. So for me, I feel so sad about this because people don't know. And when the land is polluted, if I go back to the story I was giving, if the land is polluted, you know, we cannot, we, we cannot challenge radioactive like radioactivity when they are released and the radiation in the ground. So sometimes people end up migrating, leaving the place to look for a better one, which is so sad. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, Anna, I saw you. Um, yeah, so important to to make all of these, these connections and um, I find it challenging that, yeah, so so often in these discussions about nuclear policy and nuclear weapons, we only talk about what would happen if someone would uh, detonate a bomb, but it's it's about so much more as as you just made uh, so clear. Um, it's about the uranium mining. It's about water justice. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's about so much more about migration, about can I, yeah, can I have food security, water security, all of that for my family? And um, if we do not talk about it and act as if this is not an issue for us because we don't live around nuclear weapons or our country doesn't have nuclear weapons, then yeah, we just turn a blind eye on 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 issues of of, of justice. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for for um, explaining that. Um, yeah, Anna, you wanted to respond to that. Yes, thank you. I just um, had another thought or point that I thought I'm adding um, to everything great that has been said. Um, really, on that point of different fights for justice and how they're interconnected, and who sees these interconnections and who doesn't yet. And I'm also um, addressing an activist or an advocacy uh, target group group here. Because if we do, like I mentioned before, um, start with a, a point of view of like a um, power structural dimension and questioning power structures, then these connections are being made. And they're being made already and they have been made by those who have been impacted by different kinds of injustices, um, which is not uh, surprising because of these unequal power structures globally which are patriarchal, which are capitalist, which are colonial, um, they, they are those uh, who have been 
mostly and disproportionately responsible for why injustices are there in the world. And there are those who have been and continue to be disproportionately impacted by them. Um, and I think looking at the climate justice and the nuclear justice debate and bridging these uh, conversations and fights really, really highlights that because there are those countries and to be honest, they are not that many, right? Who have been mostly responsible for carbon emissions and why um, the climate crisis exists. And there are those, a uh, majority of the world who are not responsible for it, but who are um, disproportionately impacted by uh, the effects of the climate crisis. And in the nuclear weapons debate, the exact same thing applies. There are only a few handful, not even two handful of states who have nuclear weapons who are threatening the whole world um, by their existence. But there are those who have been, uh, who do not have nuclear weapons, who do not want to have nuclear weapons in the world, but who have been impacted by, like we said, mining, testing. Um, and I would also be cautious in calling it testing because a nuclear weapons test was a detonation as well. Um, so, and of course the nuclear weapons use uh, in 1945. Uh, so really having this power, like having this question of power and who's been disproportionately responsible for injustice, but who has disproportionately impacted by injustice is a question that, ga um, that really gaps and bridges uh, these, these conversations. And I think those communities who are impacted by both or by even more dimensions already are making these connections. They, or, they always have. But seeing these conversations and debates isolated from one another is a very Euro and Western centric way of talking and debating the world. Um, and I think that's very problematic. And I think a feminist approach should always be to try to see these interconnections. Yeah, thank you so much uh, for, for pointing that out. Um, and I think that just shows again how much in this debate is about power structures, about who holds power to define terms, to define, uh, define discussions, to define what we're talking about, who has the power um, to decide what next steps are, um, and yeah, who is also hurt and who, who is not hurt. So yeah, I think that is so important. And um, feminist foreign policy, at least in our understanding um, of, uh, of CFFP, is also a tool to challenge um, unjust power structures and to really, um, yeah, to really reframe um, how, how, how we see the world really and how we operate within foreign and security policy. Um, and with that said, connecting this like very international approach with with local activism again, I would go to to um, Elke Kolle again and ask how is feminist foreign policy then related to your activism and what do you think what role could feminist foreign policy play with regard to nuclear weapons? Yes, if I look at the activism in the past 20 years, against nuclear danger and risk, there are many females who work for this. I think because females are more sensitive from you, uh, human being and saving life, especially if they have children and grandchildren. And females are more suffering from radiation. I will remind to the glassy babies born after the nuclear testing in the Pacific. Uh, I think you know this. Therefore, feminist aspects are most important in the discussion of nuclear risk. I think so, I'm sure. It's very important. That's all in the moment. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I think, at least for me, but also a lot of people working in this more international space, it is just so important to always keep uh, local fights and local struggles um, in mind and to not, yeah, leave that out of sight, uh, but to always reconnect to why are we doing certain things and what are actual local demands about uh, certain things and how can we translate them into uh, the international arena. So yeah, thank you so much. Um, I would maybe yeah have one 
more question for uh, Nyombi and then maybe like a more general question and then would open it uh, or, or would open the, the Q&A. There are already some questions, so yeah. Um, talking about, and I think um, Anna mentioned this already, uh, how can we better combine movements and combine struggles and really approach a, mo a more intersectional perspective? I would um, uh, ask you, Nyombi, do you share the feeling that currently uh, the anti-nuclear movement and the climate movement operate separately from each other? And how would you say could we bring these movements um, and uh, voices together? Uh, thank you again, Shina. Uh, actually, I feel it, and uh, I know why why this is happening, that we are not yet uh, united and working together. For quite some time, people have been threatened by nuclear as a word. Sometimes you post it and someone will be like, oh my God, what is that? And many people, uh, some from, from those who are from Japan, they lost families and friends. So people have gone through all these stories. Some are still looking for stories concerning this. And whenever they listen to them, like they, there is a change in heart where they feel like, oh, this story is touching. I fear to talk about it because some fear to create anxiety in public. But how are we going to solve this to see that everyone is able to talk about it in a, in a good way, uh, where even activists from environmental movement can talk about it or at least do something or join the movement. One is by making educational documentaries that are not only show negative aspects of nuclear weapons, but, or, okay, let's say a negative aspect of nuclear weapons or positive aspects of pressuring leaders to ratify the treaty on the non proliferation of nuclear weapon. What we can do is when we are to create this educational doc documentaries, let them be uh, educational, but also show opportunities and benefits for young people who would like to join the movement. How are they going to benefit? That is the first question that needs to be answered. And uh, the other one is we need more resources and books, even online publication that link the two, climate change and nuclear weapon. We have been uh, seeing environmental activists coming into the fight, but they don't, they don't learn this from school. They are getting it from internet. But when you can search about nuclear weapon, how these two interlink, the information is still wanting. We need to push uh, scientists that are working with maybe on IPCC because that report is trusted. We need to push them to release a report that interlink the two to make it easier for young people in climate movement to get a chance to read about it and understand the clear meaning of the two. But also, uh, this might be my last point, uh, we need to, to make sure we include them or I can need to make sure include this climate activists in environmental movement in their conversation. Invite them, let them be part of the events, like conferences, like TPNW events. Let them attend. Even if they are not going to speak, let them attend and listen. I attended once, and when I attended, I learned something. And from that time, I think I'm contributing somehow. So this should be a starting point, but let it be a must that I listen every TPNW event. You invite some activists to be part of the movement. Climate activists, they are interested in standing up for humanity. But how are they going to come? We need to have a strategic plan because I believe we share the same goal. To demand a free world, we need a massive turnout on protests. We need a massive turnout on protests. The time is now to say no more developing nuclear weapon. And we must reduce our, resi like our resilience to nuclear energy. As I said before that I'm seeing a lot of nuclear energy facilities being built in Europe, the United States and Asia. But where would the material come from? This material doesn't come from heaven. It emerged from underground and the consequences are extremely dangerous. For example, considering the years it took Hiroshima and Nagasaki to recover 
from the radioactivity, diseases, and land pollution. Whenever I think about that, I get scared. And if you are not scared, then you are not paying attention because this is serious. Thank you. Absolutely. And yeah, just to repeat that, I think it's so important if you're not scared, and I would add, if you're not angry, then you're not paying attention, like then something, I don't know, you're missing something. Um, so yeah, that is so important um, that that we just continue to to work on this and to see these interlinkages and to also, and, and I thought it was quite beautiful how you shared that. I think it's so important that we communicate to everyone, but specifically young people, there is a place for you with injustice movements. It doesn't, you don't have to be the loudest. You don't have to attend like a protest or anything. There are so many like tasks and so much work to do. There is a place for you. And I think we have to just do that in a more inviting uh, manner to, to people all over. Um, yeah, I would have one question. I had that originally planned for uh, Elke Kolo, but I would actually uh, ask it to all of you uh, because I quite like the question. Um, and then I would open uh, for the Q&A. So what would be your key demand or wish if you could have one wish granted right away when it comes to uh, nuclear weapons, apart from nuclear weapons being abolished, obviously? <laughs> oh. Please, Jenna, please allow me two wishes. Of course, two. you will get two wishes. <laughs> My first demand is that Germany will sign the TPNW and anti-nuclear sharing in the NATO, because I think it will change something, make the first move. And my second demand is that Germany starts a strong and significantly initiative to disarm the nuclear weapons round over the board. I hope we wish this all. Thank you so much. Yeah, they are both so important. So obviously you will get two wishes. Yeah, who else? Bea, yes, please. Well, I mean, of course, I, I, I subscribe for Jelke's <laughs> wishes too. So if she gets her wishes, then I can add another wish. <laughs> That's that we have three suddenly. Um, no, I, I think that, you know, I, I'm just really inspired by the conversations about around the intersectional perspectives and joining other movements and different groups of people. And I think that, you know, my wish would really be that people like find um, the courage to speak up on this and, and dare to speak up on nuclear weapons even if they don't know all of the technical details like there's actually really and i know anna talked about this in the beginning there's actually not that much that you need to know it's a really bad bomb it's terrible when it goes off a lot of civilians die that's all you actually need to know like everything else is just a distraction to make it too complex so my wish would be that people really find the courage to address it to challenge those in power because those in power are counting on us to not pay attention to this issue and to not speak out on this issue and they are very we know that they are very scared of people making these links that there will be a movement of uh, women talking about feminist perspectives about this that there's an anti-colonial kind of push for people from all of the countries uh, around the world that don't have nuclear weapons will start to speak out and that's why they you can also see how they're trying to like almost greenwash the kind of context around this. Like there's a lot of talk about women at the table in the kind of establishment as well. And they're trying to kind of legitimize it by just bringing some women who will agree with them into the kind of small, small closed circles. And I think that that's why it's so important that everyone speaks on this and everyone has an opinion and gets the sort of confidence. So I would wish that people have, you know, more confident about this, even if you don't know all of the facts, you don't need it. Yeah, amazing. Thank you. Nyombi and Anna, any any wishes from your side or demands? Uh, okay, uh, I think Beatrice has said almost everything, but yeah, even me when I attended the event, I didn't, I think I didn't know much. Even when I was applying, I, I thought they would not select me, but when I went there, I think I learned a lot, uh, but the purpose of attending event actually is, is, is not all about speaking, no. I came back with a lot of resources, just that my suitcase was full. I came back with a lot of books concerning 
nuclear weapon in Asia and everything. So this has been helping me. That's why I always emphasize that when you give them a chance, if someone is wise enough, they can get more resources from there because people come with a lot of handouts and everything that helps you to learn even from your home. But my wish is to everyone understand that uh, we are going through tough time where leaders only enjoy getting profit from our death. So we need to make sure we don't give them a chance to celebrate now, today you are seeing the war in Ukraine. A lot is happening and no one cares. So you can see, meaning there's, there is someone who benefits. So we need to make sure all this is phased out. And it is our role. You can't say uh, there is a war somewhere, so it will not come to my side. One day, one time, it, the same thing might come to your side. So it is all about you understanding what do I want to see in the future? What, do, what, should, what should my children see in the future? That's all. If you imagine about that, definitely you will do something. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I when I end, I had a little bit of time to think about, which is good. Um, I wish that we, everybody, depending on who we is, right? But let's say in the German context. Um, because this is about the German context specifically today too. Um, I want that we start every conversation about nuclear weapons with listening to survivors of nuclear violence. And if we start with that, if that's the baseline in conversations in parliament, in conversations in advocacy circles and activist circles, in conversation, like in every debate, in every conversation, that's the baseline, that's the starting point. Um, it's very, very difficult to talk about how great nuclear deterrence and uh, nuclear weapons keep us safe. That's very difficult to do. Um, so I think I wish for changing the starting point of the de of debates and conversations, because if we change that starting point and that baseline, I think the conversations and how it unfolds will change and also political demands um, and hopefully political action will also change or at least start pointing into a direction um, of change. And that change does mean for me disarmament and abolition because that's like where it's leading to. Um, when we start this conversation um, at that point. So that was my wish, changing the starting point of um, every conversation we have. So if you have a con, like if you talk about nuclear weapons with anybody, if you tell them about this event, uh, start with that um, and highlight that. Absolutely, so important. Thank you all, um, amazing wishes. <laughs> yeah, I have. I would agree with all of them, and uh, I can only say that we at CFP are trying to work towards them, but yeah, it's uh, quite the battle, as, as all of you know. Um, yeah, I would uh, now open the Q&A uh, session. There are quite a bit of uh, questions. I would start, I think we partly answered this, actually, but I would still ask it. Uh, it's specifically for Bea and uh, Nyombi. In what ways do you think we can currently best contribute to shifting the gendered narrative on nuclear weapons and raising awareness of the environmental injustices and impacts caused by them and the nuclear industry? You'll just, yeah, I, yeah, but yeah, I saw you, yeah, you start. Um, yeah, I mean, I think we need to, um need to call it out when we see it. Um, I think we've been quite good and I can to sort of, uh, sometimes when people say things to us like, oh, you're so naive or you're so unrealistic. It's sort of like, you know, that's really gendered terms. And uh, the idea that nuclear deterrence is like flawless forever and all these nine dudes with nuclear weapons, they're just going to behave. They're never gonna, never gonna make a mistake. That's naive, right? Like, so you can kind of like, I think it's good to kind of showcase people how the, the language uh, is used to kind of shame people or to dismiss it. We've had, for example, the, you know, a government um, that has been impacted from nuclear weapons, um, 
uh, Pacific Island states spoke out very strongly against some proposals from the nuclear weapon states at the NPT, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty Review Conference. And the French ambassador said that, oh, I feel like we're getting very emotional here. So it's like a very kind of um, uh, dismissive way. Uh, whereas, you know, so you, I think it's important to kind of highlight that because once you expose it and you say it out loud, uh, they get really embarrassed by it and don't like to, because I don't want it to sound like that. I mean, they will still continue to do it, but I think it's like it's easier than to just make a point out of it and almost dismiss what they're saying. Uh, so I think that's an effective strategy to also showcase the other people around that we don't tolerate that kind of language or we are going to call it out and we are going to say, you know, point it out. Uh, so that that's, I think is really important. Um, I also think it's important to, um, work with your allies as always, and to sort of find um, people who agree with you and have them because it's really draining. I, I for example, have spent a lot of time in these kind of NATO conference, the Munich Security Conference. There's like these people who are so pro all weapons and it's like a very, it's really hard to be, stay strong in those moments. You feel like, am I the, am I the wrong one? Like you, you start doubting yourself. So I think it's, but then you go into like in Vienna, for example, that Nyombri was talking about, like, and you go into this really amazing place where you have a lot of activists and everyone is like, oh yeah, yeah, I remember. Like we're, we're, we're you know, we have each other's back. So I think it's very important for us to dare to challenge these things, to have your own sort of safety net of people that you can kind of like remind yourself that we're not, we're not like, it's not us. That, that's the problem. It's them who's, who's the problem. Um, so yeah, I, th I think that. And I, also my favorite personal thing is to, when people very argue very strongly in favor of nuclear weapons, I like to use those kind of passive aggressive words against them. Like, well, I, I thank you for your passion for this. You can see these men like get a little bit confused. Like that, that didn't, it, it kind of was a compliment, but it didn't feel good. You could see their brain like feeling that. I'm like, mm -hmm. so. Amazing, thank you. Um, Yomi, do you want to add uh, on that? Uh, just, just adding from what Beatrice has said, uh, yeah, we always need to work with our ally because even on the internet, we always see that. I always try, try my best. Okay, what I can say is uh, we have to beat them with facts because what wins is, the truth will always review itself. So beat them with facts because in the end, we have to achieve even gender justice in this world. We can't have peace without gender justice. So we have to make sure we push for this by beating whoever comes with facts and reality. And in the end, they feel exposed. Just give them the real facts, what is available. But we have to continue to fight for both gender equality, peace, and climate justice. So we need, we need to continue fighting for those because they, we cannot be stable in the world with all those free climate change, wars, gender equality, and without peace. So that's it. Thank you. Thank you both. Um, then there are two questions I would actually like to put together because they're both on education. Um, maybe one for um, Egg Hikolo, which is um, there's a prospective social studies teacher, uh, political education, asking uh, what are topics that you would like to see in the classroom? Like, what do we have to teach or what do we have to talk about in the classroom? Uh, what, is, what is important there? I mean, obviously anyone can answer, but uh, maybe you have something for that. And then uh, I would combine it. There's another question asking for educational opportunities and workshops for individuals in governments, I love that, <laughs> such as Germany, uh, to learn the interconnections of advocacy work and how feminist foreign policy aims to address these issues together. What do these opportunities look like? Mm, yeah, okay, yeah, maybe let's take both of these together. Um, oh. <laughs> Yeah, I could call it, yeah. Would My you... English not so close, but, but I will try. I think um, it's a very um, difficult. Uh, uh, it's a problem if you um, show the young people the risks uh, too much. Because um, can I say it's in England, in Deutsch. Deutsch? When yeah, yeah, please. When do um, I have immer gehört, when man also die Leute schockt, dann, dann hören sie nicht mehr zu. 
Also wenn man ihnen zu schlimme Geschichten erzählt, ähm, dann, dann, ähm, ja, dann machen sie zu, dann hören sie nicht mehr zu und wollen davon nichts wissen. Die möchten das von sich wegschieben. Kannst du mir das übersetzen, bitte, Sheila? Natürlich. Ja, uh, yeah, so I'm just translating uh, what, uh, what Elke has been saying. So that um, the, one of the problems is that If people are confronted with stories that are too devastating about like, you know, all of the violence and death and yeah, just what we're talking about around nuclear weapons, then people are shocked. And once they're shocked, they stop listening. So you, you kind of lose them. So we have to find ways where we articulate better stories and talk actually about the topic instead of shocking people because uh, we then might lose them. Mm -hmm. Das habe ich jetzt nicht verstanden. <lacht> Please, uh, Hildegard would like to explain. Can you, can you? Aber natürlich, bitte. <lacht> We have an extra panelist. So. <lacht> um, I think it's very important uh, to improve uh, the not acknowledge about uh, the Uh, danger of nuclear weapons uh, in our parliament. So I can and IPPNB are uh, working on this, that they have a hearing there. And this is a point where we can uh, bring our knowledge to uh, certain people. That's a, a very uh, important way. Yes. yes. Thank you so yes. much. Like the parliament, give this. Yes, I think it's a good way. Um, and maybe uh, <laughs> I wasn't asked, but I would I just come here as a former political educator. I think what's um, coming back to the question in the in the classroom, I think, and that actually speaks to a lot what also Niambi and, and Anna shared. I think young people, no matter how old, have a lot of opinions and a lot of knowledge, actually. They maybe just Or they might just articulate it in different ways. So I think it is it is the wrong way to say, oh, this topic is too complicated and too complex to talk about uh, uh, with youth and with children. I just think we have to find ways where does this topic connect to young people's lives? Where does it connect to the concerns and uh, the 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 sorrows and just the interests that that children and that youth have and, and then and then do educational programs um on nuclear weapons around that um i think that's very very important to also not think about this in a silo but just ask young people how how would you like to approach this topic and i think that's something i can only speak for germany but We don't do that a lot in the classroom. We don't do that at all in our in our educational system. But I think that that would be very very important. And um, from like a CFP perspective on the other question, I don't know of any such workshops for uh, individuals in governments. I just know that a lot of civil society. Um, organizations like ours or others are always open to give workshops and to talk to people if um, we are asked and if I may add if we are fairly compensated for it um, uh, because a lot of activism and a lot of work we put in is just is just not paid for so I think that's one of one of the clashes but I think although civil society yes obviously we criticize a lot but we're always um, We're always open to to help and to collaborate uh, if if uh, if people let us and if governments let us. So uh, yeah. Um, and uh, sorry, did anyone else wanted to add on that other? Yeah, if not, then I would go to the next question. There's one for Nyambi. Um, concerning mining, what would you say to green activists advocating, oh, that's very specific, advocating electric vehicles on the impact of lithium mining? You don't have to respond to that, but if you want to, please. <laughs> yeah, I can just say that uh, everyone, uh, whoever joined activism, I think they have their own source of like, information so whenever you see someone advocating for anything that goes against your wish or what you think you can try and ask them how you came 
to this. But how many people have been advocating for electric cars? Because I think I use them when I travel because that is what I always ask. But I think it's not right because it also contribute to mining, which I'm against. At the same time, there are a lot of cases, there are a lot of reports that have come out where they said uh, uh, country countries uh, for companies from Western world are you are forcing child like are using child children into this labor because they are so uh, they are very cheap. So I've had a lot of, uh, I've seen a lot of articles, even the Guardian released one where US was trying to find someone, I don't know which rich guy was that, uh, for you for using child labor. So it was it was also on lithium. So uh, for me, I don't support it. I always on I always stick on clean energy, where I say we can have solar cars, we can have them. It might take time. But if we start planning now, we can have solar cars everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, one final question, um, maybe, and then uh, I would uh, go on with our two final points. Um, and I think this is so important for, for um, all of us, actually. Um, the question is, is there any literature you can recommend for someone to get into the topic, like any standard books, articles that you should read? Um, and that was not in a question, but I would add um, maybe also activists or people to follow uh, on social media. Sorry, and question goes out to all of you. So whoever wants to have a go. Um, yeah, sorry. Did I go? Yeah. Um, so, I mean, there's so much literature about nuclear weapons and it's can everything from very simple um, kind of infographics on Instagram. You can look at like ICANN, we, it's at nuclear ban on all platforms, TikTok, Instagram, uh, Twitter, for example. Um, I know I can Germany has also accounts uh, that does more of these kind of things in German. Um, those are like very top line messages trying to communicate some of these complex things in very simple way. Um, you will also find on ICANW.org our website where we have briefing papers. Of course, the Center for Feminist Foreign Policy has a lot of material on feminist foreign policy and the connections between nuclear weapons and, and gender issues and feminist foreign policy. Uh, I can Germany has a lot of specific material on um, uh, in German as well, and of course there's Wilf Germany and activists on Bushel. You know, will have a lot of really great information as well for the more kind of you know a briefing paper that's two three pages for example. Um, and then you have the deeper stuff that is sort of literature like books for example. There's a really excellent book by Ray Atchison called Banning the Bomb, I think. Um, ban the bomb, banning the bomb, uh, Ray Atchison, bomb, ban, some, what, what are the combinations? There's many books with similar titles. Um, that's really, that looks at this from a feminist perspective as well. Uh, and really, really interesting. Um, of course, um, Christina Lunds from Center for Feminist Foreign Policy has written a book about feminist foreign policy that I think is really good. I haven't read it because it's in German, but I'm waiting for excitedly for the English translation of it. Um, end of March, to... end of March. End of March, oh, exciting, exciting. Uh, but I've heard it's very good in German. <laughs> um, so there is a lot of really great literature and a lot of really great books. And I think it's important to, you don't have to read books in order to understand this issue. It's also easy to read like shorter things. Um, and, you know, just, yeah, feel free to follow ICANN's different social media accounts. And of course, Center for Feminist Foreign Policy, ICANN Germany and Wilf Germany and, and all of them as well. Thank you. Uh, I see you're talking, but you're still muted. Me? Yeah, no. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. I, would rec I would like to recommend poetry. Uh, because um, I think we need to consider different kinds of knowledge articulations um, to also start connecting um, to certain topics and issues through different like ways in different ways and also to reach different people. And I've learned so much um, from poetry by specifically Pacific women who have been um, 
poets, who have been scholars, who have been activists. Um, and I will recommend one, uh, I will put it in the chat uh, in a second, uh, the selected works by Teresa Dewa, um, a Pacific scholar, but also poet. And in these selected works, there are um, essays as well as some of her scholarship, but also some of her poetry. Um, and she has been, um, she, like her work has been very influential on how I think um, a global debate can also be switched uh, in where we are starting and how we are, um, how we're starting to having these conversations. And also, and I want to add on that because this is something that I find crucial, what is considered legitimate knowledge and how does knowledge and knowledge, articulation, knowledge articulations um, are being legitimized or delegitimized. And I would just like to really point out that especially in feminist scholarship, um, ways like poetry have always been very like influential ways of knowledge uh, sharing. Um, and yeah, uh, I will put it in the chat. So I'm definitely uh, recommending that for everybody who's interested. Thank you. Um, Ed. Uh, yes. Yes. Uh, we had some pe uh, experience in to make three, uh, street theater. It's it's a very good uh, opinion to go into the uh, towns and to make street theater. We had some acts, uh, some different acts we had done in Cologne, in Trier, and so on, in Mainz, and so on. And then, then you can um, um, verteilen, um, flyers. flyers can give can informations. informations, because uh, the people are interested when you make a street theater, it's a good opinion. Amazing, thank you. Nyambi, anyone you would like to share? Uh, just wanted to respond to that one question. Uh, there is the last question that just came in about how mining, like linked to floods and so on. Uh, yeah, that is the question I wanted to talk about. Uh, first is mining, mining everywhere is not right because uh, climate change, is not all about floods or drought or landslide. It's a lot because even these rising temperatures are also dangerous to humanity. They are dangerous to our land. Even if the land, has, the soil has been so fertile and you have been getting a lot of food from that soil. If there is mining that leave forests down, definitely you will not receive rainfall. So mining is dangerous in all forms. And though most of the time, the the biggest challenge we receive when there is mining, it, when it is near, okay, when mining is carried out near uh, lake shores or river banks, something like that, where they call out uh, sand mining, it can be dangerous because when it rains, water always spread all over because they create those, is it called cockpits, something like a holes that they are left in areas whenever it, whenever it happens. So, uh, mining is dangerous. It might not cause floods in some areas, but it can cause drought in that area. So I'm looking at two sides. Thank you. Thank you so much, yeah, for getting back to that question. That was still in the Q&A, uh, thanks. Um, yeah, I would um, share one last recommendation of who to follow, who is uh, Leona Morgan, uh, indigenous activist uh, from New Mexico, who is doing incredibly critical and amazing work, who's usually very outspoken, very loud uh, and amazing in these spaces. So um, that's someone to, to, to follow, I would say. Um, yeah, uh, I would now share a few words um, and then hand over to Anna. And then I think we're done. We might go like five minutes over time. I'm apologizing, uh, but I hope you will stick with us. If you have to leave um, at, uh, at 6.30 sharp, uh, I fully understand. 
Um, yeah, I just wanted to share that all of uh, all of the topics and issues that we talked about and many of uh, the recommendations and demands that um, uh, uh, Bea shared in the beginning in her keynote, but also that others have shared here on the panel are actually also entailed in our uh, new policy briefing, a feminist take on nuclear weapons in Germany. Um, and this project, which uh, was uh, thankfully um, uh, financially supported by ICANN. Um, so yeah, thanks uh, at, at, at this point for, the, for that. Um, a lot of that is in that policy briefing and uh, this event uh, and amazing discussion was also an opportunity to, to launch that policy briefing. Uh, as I've said in the beginning, um, yeah, just striving for nuclear disarmament. And I get that it seems like a difficult time to do that, um, but I think it's always still the right time to do that. Um, uh, that's just very dear to, to our hearts. So um, launching this policy briefing, doing this event and being outspoken on this topic, although it, it might seem hard or is hard sometimes, it's just so important. And we hope that people take a lot uh, from the policy briefing. There are clear recommendations for the German government on what to do. Um, so yeah, uh, we hope uh, you may read it, you like it, um, or maybe not, let us know. Um, uh, always happy about uh, uh, criticism as well. And yeah, what will you find within the policy briefing um, are, yeah, outlines what a German feminist foreign policy requires in terms of nuclear policy, which are, and I will name three uh, points shortly here. Uh, first, listening and working closely with critical feminist civil society and the people impacted by uh, the decision to host nuclear weapons, which in Germany would be local activists and the population in Second, looking at the issue of nuclear weapons in all its complexity and recognizing its interlinkages with colonialism, the climate crisis, and reproductive justice, which uh, many activists have long raised often feminists, youth, and affected communities. And uh, third, prioritizing disarmament and nuclear disarmament, as well as demilitariz demilitarization to achieve uh, sustainable feminist peace. And I think um, my colleague, yes, thank you so much, uh, just shared the link uh, where you will find the policy briefing online. And um, yeah, uh, with that, uh, I would hand over to Anna for a final uh, feminist plea and intervention. Thank you so much. Um, I'm kind of honored to end this really, really, really nice event. Um, and I was asked to end it with a feminist plea. Um, I've never done that, so I'm trying to uh, do justice um, to that. Nuclear weapons are a patriarchal instrument of power demonstration, and therefore they are a contradiction to um, aiming for a coherent feminist foreign policy. One central question from a feminist point of view is always what keeps us safe. And asking this question critically and with a feminist consciousness challenges the status quo and dominant assumptions of an understanding of security. The existence of weapons of mass destruction and their implicit or explicit threat of use, or in the worst case scenario, their potential use can never and will never keep us safe. And even if hopefully nuclear weapons will never be used ever again, their sole existence cannot be seen isolated of global and transgenerational dimensions of patriarchal and colonial nuclear legacies. And these nuclear weapons stationed in Bücher in Germany, they have been tested somewhere. And the resources to produce these weapons, they have been extracted from somewhere. And this somewhere is not just anywhere. This somewhere has been and continues to be disproportionately indigenous as well as formerly colonized land all around the globe where people and their land continue to face the environmental, physical, social, political, and mental con consequences of nuclear violence and injustice through radioactive contamination, exploitation, and displacement. A feminist nuclear weapons policy needs to center and highlight the lived realities of impacted communities all around the world. But how can that be done? 
by policymakers as well as by anti-nuclear activists and advocates calling for a feminist nuclear weapons policy in Germany. Affected communities should not be seen in a tokenistic and paternalistic way only as victims by highlighting their victimhood. This might lead to using their lived realities in a very sensationalized way. There's a need to go beyond only wanting to highlight humanitarian and environmental consequences of nuclear weapons by including perspectives and voices, which might have been invisibilized and neglected in German discourse, yes, but a holistic understanding of an intersectional feminist approach always starts with um, and centers lived realities of those impacted. I personally have learned and continue to learn from fellow anti-nuclear advocates around the world, especially those who are survivors. And I want, to I want to end this, this event and also my plea with highlighting what I have learned. Firstly, there's a transgenerational dimension of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are an issue of transgenerational justice and an issue of reproductive just justice, and therefore they are a feminist issue. Secondly, there's a global dimension of nuclear weapons. Nuclear weapons are an issue of environmental, racial, and social justice, and therefore they are a feminist issue. And thirdly, knowledge coming from lived experience is valid and legitimate knowledge. Lastly, reimagination is a very strong feminist polit political praxis. Reimagining a world without nuclear weapons and collectively, self-reflectively, and critically, continuously working every day to that goal on a global, national, and local level needs courage and a sense of community of care. So I want to end with say, let's have more courage for some feminist reimaginations and towards nuclear abolition. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Amazing. Yeah, nothing to add. Um, thank you so much for all your work uh, in, in this field. And I know I've been learning a lot from you, not only today, um, but uh, yeah. And yeah, that's sad. We're at the end of this webinar, uh, which personally I enjoyed very much uh, listening to our speakers, but also enjoyed the questions we got and uh, super happy about all of uh, all of you who attended and listened. Um, and yeah, so uh, just a big, big thank you and shout out to Elke, Anna, Nyombi and Bea. Thank you so much for being here, for taking the time. It's been such an honor and pleasure. Um, thank you also to my team, specifically uh, Caroline and Vivian. You did not see them, but they did the tech support behind the scenes. Thank you so much for that. And also again, uh, specifically uh, mentioning Vivian, who has been co-writing um, the policy briefing with me and just uh, done such an amazing uh, work and uh, yeah I think it's fair to say this webinar and the policy briefing uh, would not be here with without her work so uh, thank you so much for that and um, yeah I just can just say I hope to see many of you uh, join the feminist fight uh, for nuclear disarmament and against nuclear weapons if you haven't yet um, and uh, follow us, follow ICANN, uh, follow local initiatives um, and so many others on social media. Um, and yeah, uh, just uh, keep us updated about what you do. If you want to share anything, uh, you can always reach, reach us via our website um, or uh, social media. And yeah, thank yeah. you and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Did you want to say something, Yambi? Sorry. Uh, yeah. Yes, I wanted to conclude by saying uh, those who like to join the movement in a, in a movement, I can movement or climate movement. You just don't need to be perfect. No way we cannot be perfect because we are not told this in school unless the coming generation, but I haven't seen that in school. So uh, it is through your imperfection that you become perfect. It is just a matter of time. Educate yourself as you join. By the time you will be mature enough to say something that are uh, shaking, yeah, we'll be very fast. So we need you now. Thank you. Thank you. Nothing to add to that. So <laughs> I would just uh, shut up now <laughs> and release you all into your evening and day. Thank you for being here.
Bye.